All right, people are coming in and we are live. Good afternoon, everybody. We're just gonna let everybody in and everybody join us on Facebook and we'll get started in just a moment. Always going back and forth. Hello. Oh, a couple more people, but we'll go ahead. Um, Lynn, do you want to just kind of, uh, well, no, we don't want to welcome you up. We want Adriana to start. I'm sorry. <laughs> but I just, I want to make sure that we get, get, just give a couple, like another minute for people to um, join before we start. So nothing's missed with the captioning. Yep. Hello everyone. Hola a todos. Hola Diana. Hola María. Bienvenida. Hello María. Va a ser el proceso de interpretación. Va a ser abajo subtítulo en inglés o. Ya vamos a dar instrucciones. Okay, gracias. Okay, Adriana, do you want to go ahead and start? Yes, sure. Just tell me when you want me to share this. Okay. Yes. Bueno, bienvenidos a todos a nuestro evento especial de regreso a la escuela con CIPAC. En el día de hoy, las consultoras de padres de CIPAC, Liona, Lisa y Lynn, nos van a hablar acerca de las diferencias entre la educación en el hogar, instrucción en el hogar por condiciones médicas o homebound instruction en inglés y el aprendizaje a distancia. Quiero informarles que aunque la conversación va a ser en inglés, contamos con subtítulos en español. Para aquellos que se unen a nosotros vía Zoom, Por favor, revisen el chat y van a ver un link que se llama streamtext.net. Ese es un enlace eh, el cual ustedes pueden hacer clic y ya les mostraré lo que va a pasar. Ok, Leona, whenever you're ready. Ok, una vez ustedes hacen clic en ese enlace que está en el chat, Eh, esta pantallita va a salir. Se abre una nueva pantalla a lo largo de la barra del menú superior hacia la derecha. Ustedes van a observar un botón que dice Languages. Uh, Leona, can you go to where it says Languages? El, 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 pre, el idioma seleccionado premeditado es inglés, pero ustedes lo tienen que sacar y ponerlo en español. Una vez lo tengan en español, los subtítulos empezarán a aparecer en esa pantalla. Ustedes pueden también reubicar el tamaño de la pantalla al hacer clic en la donde está señalan, señalando León en estos momentos. Ahí pueden reducir el tamaño de su pantalla para que tengan um, las dos pantallas de las consultoras y de la traducción a la par. Eh, eso es todo. Eh, los invitamos a que escriban sus comentarios, preguntas en el chat. Muchas gracias y bienvenidos. Ok. We're good to go. Okay, Lynn, I'm going to turn it over to you to introduce what we're going to be talking about today. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining. We appreciate having you all on board. My name is Lynn Rule. I am a parent consultant with the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center, 
And I have two children who are still in the public school system, one who is receiving special ed services. So over the next four days, we are going to be talking about some of the challenges that we are all facing and going back to school. There are 2 million questions at least that we have, and we hope that we might be able to answer some of them for you. So over the course of the next four days, if there's a topic that you really want to hear a little bit more about, if you wanna mention that to us when we start talking about questions, Today we're going to be talking about some of the different terminology that we've heard regarding the various programs that are being provided by, this, by the districts. So in addition to myself, Lynn, I also am here with Lisa Opert. Do you want to introduce yourself? Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Opert. Hi, Maggie. <laughs> um, I have four children. I'm also a parent consultant. Two of my children will be receiving IEP services this year. Um, and we're excited and nervous and curious about what this year is going to look like. I think it'll be as positive as we make it. So hopefully. <laughs> it will be. We're going to make it positive. Yes. And also with us is Leona. Leona. Hi, everybody. We're happy to see you today. My name, for those that don't know, my name is Leona Domchek. I'm also a parent consultant with CVAC. I have three boys. Uh, I have two kids on an IEP and one child on a 504. So we are um, very excited about uh, what this year is going to entail and um, how we're going to move forward. So as we go through the, um, the afternoon, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat and we will be addressing them as, as we go forward. So just a little bit of background information for those of you who don't, are not familiar with CPAC. Um, under IDEA, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, every state is required to have a parent training information center. And so for the state of Connecticut, CPAC is that center. So our job here today is to try to inform you, let you know what the information is that we have as of today at three o'clock, because this is all rapidly changing. And so we wanna to try to give you uh, the, the most, the most up-to-date information. We also wanna remind you that this session is on Facebook Live and it is being recorded and will be played on YouTube. So we just ask that you keep that in mind when it comes to sharing any personal information about you, yourself, or your children. Um, we are going to be muting folks during the course of uh, this time, but if you have questions, we'd be happy to unmute you so that you can participate. And we also want to state as we are going through the various options that are uh, available within Connecticut, we are not going to advise people one way or the other what is going to be best for you. Uh, we know what works best for us and in our individual situations, but we just want to mention that up front. So with that, let's talk about what we are, what we are looking at um, as Connecticut, whoops, as CPAC goes back to school. So there are three learning models that the state of Connecticut has advised districts to provide to parents. One is full in school, in person, in school for all, like the way that we were uh, prior to March 13th, everyone is in school and re receiving instruction personally. A hybrid model, a combination of in-person and in-school instruction, as well as a remote piece and full remote learning where instruction is going to be delivered remotely. And we are not going to reference this as being what we had previously because things are definitely going to be uh, changing and things are being provided in a different manner than what we had back in May. Just to kind of give you an indication as to what we are looking at, this was an article that was in the Connecticut Examiner last, uh, last week. And as of August 14th, there were 42 towns across the state that at that time had decided to go back to in full in-person education in the fall you can see everybody is doing something different. And we even have New Haven here that was looking to go full remote. And I believe that since this article has taken place, 
There are a couple of other districts that have also opted to go full remote to begin the year and then an option to go into a hybrid model after the fact. So you can see that things are very different, but just because somebody, just because we have all of these that are here in orange that are showing hybrid, they're not all the same. So this is just an example of some of the hybrid models that we have found out about. We have two weeks in school and two weeks remote. We have an every other day option. We have two days in, two days at home with a day off for extra help. Some options include one day off for everyone where the schools are being deep cleaned. Um, and then as I mentioned, a situation where we have everyone is, is remote and then they are going hybrid. So my district here, we are right here. We are the every other day model and our kids will be going to school Monday, Wednesday, Friday, one week, and then Tuesday, Thursday, the following week. Um, Leona, Lisa, do you wanna share with what you are? Yeah, it, if our, uh, sure I will. So in our district, if, uh, when we need to, if we need to go to a hybrid model, because it is not the model that we are starting with, uh, we are that green in the middle of the state and we're going face to face. But if we were to go to a hybrid model, we would be a two week on, two week off uh, model. So kids would be in a cohort together for two weeks in the classroom and then they would be going home for two weeks. Lisa? And for us, our district is very small um, and they have chosen to start in school uh, full time. Um, and that was what we chose for our family. We thought that for our four children who are all elementary school children, um, our class sizes are very small and that's what we're going with. Happily. <laughs> so I think it's also important to really stress that you, in light of all of this, it is very important that you are familiar with the exact plan that your district is has in place. The model that they have in place is going to be very different as you can see. And it's very important that you understand not only what they are, uh, what they are providing, but in addition, how that is going to impact you and your family. So when we also look at some of these distance learning options, or remote learning options, excuse me. There are some situations where students will sign in and they're being taught via Zoom or on a Google Classroom. Uh, there is an actual online classroom that has been established and those students would be logging in and looking at their screen similar to what we are looking at where everyone is, is here together. In some situations, there are different teachers and that are teaching the students. So they, just as parents could select to opt into a just a remote learning process. Some teachers are being given the option to also opt in. And so therefore they may be the teacher who is providing instruction to your child. So if you are opting into remote learning and that is the situation in your school, you could be going to ABC elementary school with Mrs. Rule as your teacher, but in um, opting into remote learning, you're going to have Mrs. Opert. She's going to be the one who's teaching your children online. So in making a change, if down the road, you should make a decision to go to a hybrid model, if that is what is in your district, you would then need to make sure you provide um, time to your district so that they can prepare for it. This is all about the numbers and trying to keep the least amount of people in a building at any one time. So if you have 20 students in the classroom who suddenly decide they all want to be back in person, that school needs to make arrangements. So again, being familiar with whatever plans that are in place for your district is really important. Lisa, Leona, did you wanna add anything else to this um, piece? I I'll just, I'll just add a little bit is um, with remote learning, well, there's two sides to that. So there's the opting in side, but there's also the side where we, the uh, district closes fully and mm -hmm. everyone is, is remote learning. And there's a, there's um, a process 
in which CDC would recommend that each of these happens based on new cases. So if they were doing in person, when they switch to hybrid, and when maybe they would consider um, going to full remote learning. Uh, so we, we talk about it right now because of very few people, very few districts that we can see. I forget what color it is, but it's very few that are doing full remote learning. Um, so when we're referring to it right now, families are hearing the, the opting in as the option, but full remote learning could take place if the district was to close. So the three models that you're going over, I just wanted to emphasize the remote learning piece only because right now we view it from two perspectives. That is correct. And when you are in a hybrid model also, those days that you are home, that is not the same as opting into this remote learning piece. So it's very confusing and we thought that that this would be a good place for us to start out in terms of the discussion for the, for the week. And as Leona mentioned, depending upon the cases, there could be a situation where we do have to all revert to a distance or a remote option. And that would take a very different approach than what we have been talking about here so far. It, go ahead, Lisa. <laughs> Okay. Uh, okay. I thought you were going to say, say something. That many of the districts that are starting out in person um, for full in person learning, um, they have a certain, so when cases increase to a certain number, then they go to hybrid. And then if they continue to increase, then they're going to be moving towards remote. But each of those numbers for each state, uh, each district are all different. So I encourage you to read through those emails, those lengthy, lengthy emails from your districts to really try to understand the best that's going on in within your district about specifics to just kind of have a chance to plan if, if, if need be. Right, because the decision to shift to a remote learning policy, I guess, mm -hmm. um, would be based upon the percentage of cases that are coming up and that's all based upon your population. So in a town where you have 20,000 students, for example, some of these larger communities, that's going to look very different than one that only has a two elementary schools and they are you know, doing high school and middle school with, with uh, surrounding communities. So it's very important to understand what the district has in place. And how does remote learning compare to homebound and homeschool? And as we've been looking at some of these comments that have come across social media and some of the things we hear on the news, these three terms are being used interchangeably. And we really want to take some time to focus on the fact that these are three very, very different scenarios, with very, very different implications. Uh, something that I had recently seen on a uh, uh, social media chat was a family that wanted to start cohorting at home with some of their surrounding families and hire an outside teacher to come in and teach the kids. That's homeschool. That is taking your child out of your public school system and homeschooling them. That is That means that you no longer are entitled to anything that is related to FAPE, so free and appropriate public education. All of those protections that come under IDEA are no longer applicable. Homeschool means that you have homeschool means that you have withdrawn your child from the public school system and you are now teaching them at home. You could hire someone, you may do, be doing it yourself, but you are 100% at home. Lisa and Leona, did I do you want to add anything to that? You're muted, Lisa. <laughs> um, I was going to say I've seen lots of similar posts um, where people are choose are are stating that they're homeschooling their students when really they're choosing remote learning for their families. Um, so there's a real there's a huge difference. If you're really truly homeschooling your children, that means that the, you're releasing the district of all responsibility for their special education services, um, which is which is a big thing. Um, so when you're talking about remote learning versus homeschool, two very different things. So just make sure if you are choosing to do remote services, you're looking at your IEPs and seeing how their services are going to be delivered. 
and homeschool realize that those options, those are probably not, no longer optional for your student. Now the two, the first two that we see that are here on this graphic, remote learning and homebound, those do still provide FAPE or that coverage of FAPE, that free and appropriate public education. So remote learning is a situation where that we are all looking at right now. This is a choice that a parent may be making in order to provide instruction for their child at home. It is being delivered by the public school system. FAPE is still in place. Homebound is a medical decision. This is, the, this is a situation where a child is home for medical reasons. Um, Leona, did you wanna talk more about that in particular? You're muted. Sorry, I was go. trying to get, <laughs> okay, good. Trying to get Maria the link. Um, so with, with homebound, it's the homebound instruction is, it's its own, how to say it, it's kind of its own cup of tea because homebound really hasn't changed. What's appropriate for children who are homebound really is what is right on their IEP and how why the placement was made to homebound. So homebound students aren't necessarily joining in a remote option just because remote option is there. That still might not be the best um, environment for them at this time. So it's still very much an individual, um, as everything is an individual education plan, but homebound looks very different than these models. So if a student is placed on homebound, um, it usually is not COVID related. And <clears throat> therefore we just need to take a look at what they need and how their services can be provided to them. So before I pull away from our PowerPoint, I just want to make reference to a few pieces of information that you really should take a look at if you have not yet done so. So from the state of Connecticut, the ADAPT Advance Achieve, which is Connecticut's general plan in order to return back to school. And it's important to, for us to remember all of our students are gen ed students first. So these are the general education plans that are in place as we had mentioned, either full in school, the hybrid or the remote learning. The, there are addendums that have also been put in place from the state and each one pertains to a different segment. So I'm going to just kind of scroll through first. This is from the state of Connecticut, the Department of Education. This is the ADAPT Advance Achieve plan that I was just referencing and that, that has been translated into Spanish. There are two additional pieces that had been also provided earlier in the year, the Reimagining Connecticut Classrooms and the Sensible Assessments. These documents came out earlier in the spring, but you can also see right here, the seven addendums that have come out from the Department of Education. Addendum six is the guidance for educating students with disabilities. And that has a lot of information as it relates to special education which is the piece that we have really started to consider as we are bringing our kids back to school. How is all of this going to relate for students who are receiving special ed services? And we are not saying in special education because special education is not a place. It is services that are provided to our students. So what does that look like for our students who are going back? And at this point in time, these are conversations you truly need to be having with your district. Something we're going to talk about tomorrow is the learning model IEP, which is a piece that has been put in just with COVID and the return from COVID that discuss services that are provided, how those services are going to be provided to your students in the event that you have opted into remote learning. And also if you are in that hybrid model, what is that going to look like? So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more in detail tomorrow, but making the choice to determine how your child is going to return back to school is a very personal thing. And it does bring up an awful lot of questions. So at this point, we wanna see if anyone has any questions that they want to uh, bring up. I see there's a lot in the chat. So I don't know if people have a lot of questions that they wanted to ask or Lisa, Leona, what else you might want to add? 
I do, we do have a question in Facebook, so I will ask in a second, but I do just want to piggyback on what you said about it being a very personal decision. And what is right for each family, depending on your district, it could depend on your district, your side, your family, is a very personal decision. And I don't feel like anyone needs to necessarily justify it. It's mm -hmm. just what you've chosen. And, um, feel good with your decision and then how can we receive the best services possible in what we've chosen because we've what we're doing we've, we're all doing for a reason and only we can say that uh, what that reason is and and with that we understand there's pros and cons to every single situation there is no situation that is a hundred percent the way to go so you know just feel good about it. So in Facebook, there was a question. I'm not sure if someone wants to, who would like to answer it, but I'm gonna throw it out there. Um, actually I have two. In Connecticut, can remote learners receive services in home from the school? So let's start with that one. So that is something that we will be talking about a little bit more in detail tomorrow with the learning model IEP and what those are going to look like. And again, I think this is, again, Leona, what we were saying, it's all individual. So what is this going to look like in your individual case? Um, Lisa, did you wanna to add to that? I was going to say, I think that some people think instantly that they can go for homebound right away. And that's where I think the confusion is, is coming there. <laughs> Yeah, homebound is a very different uh, thing from remote learning. So was that was that what the question was? Uh... It was, it was, so I think we're good there. Um, our, the other question I have is our school district even uses different terms for kids who choose to stay home. So they're saying in their district, they're saying cooperative virtual learning and other terms when the district chooses virtual learning, such as distance learning, and it's confusing parents even more. So that's, I think, um, more so a statement than a question, but it's such a valid point. And mm -hmm. this is why you have to know your district's plan and what it is, and really take the time to read it and to ask questions, because if it isn't confusing enough, um, we always make the joke in Connecticut, we always have our own terms. Well, now our districts are having their own terms. Yes. <laughs> uh, so it's really important to know what it is and how that then relates to the districts um, or to the state's plan. So um, Adriana, is there any questions? I see Maria has her hand up. Is, um, yeah, so before we answer Maria, is there any questions in the Spanish chat? You're muted. Not at the moment. Okay, um, Maria, go ahead and uh, you can go ahead and unmute yourself and ask a question. Um, yo tengo una sugerencia. El material está muy bueno, la información está muy buena, pero desde que entré no he, no he entendido nada porque las instrucciones Adriana las dio eh, y no he podido configurar mi subtítulo. So, Estoy presentando la sugerencia porque los subtítulos para mí me salen en mi laptop y en mi celular en inglés. So, y he tratado de todas maneras y todos los comandos. So, hoy es lunes, okay. de aquí al jueves esperemos, digo, Perfect. espero yo poder aprender a cómo yes. poder leer en español lo que ustedes están diciendo porque para mí es una información valiosa. Claro, María. Eh, y yo las, las dije verbalmente con demostración con, Leo, con Leona y te las escribí en el chat dos veces y te las envié privadamente. Con mucho gusto redacto un email para tu futura referencia. Eh, María has um, a suggestion for the subtitles. It's not related to the material that's being covered at this moment. So I will email her and let her know how to access the, uh, the uh, captioning in Spanish, which I did. Okay. Mute. Uh, yeah, I did. I did see her question in the chat and I did private message her the link as well uh, during the thing. But thank you, Adriana. Um, so there is another question in the chat. Um, both of my children will be doing remote learning. They both have IEPs. They are legally blind, are both on the autism spectrum. How can we get the teachers to best support them? Their son is in ninth grade and their daughter is going into eighth grade. Very key years. Very, very key. 
So I think this is definitely a case where you're going to want to have a PPT meeting to talk about, get in touch with the schools, the respective schools. I'm assuming they are probably in two different schools, uh, ninth grade and, and eighth grade, middle school and, and high school. Um, most definitely want to talk to whomever their teacher is, the, the, um, the, the responsibility teacher or the case manager, it's different, again, a different term in every district, I think, um, as far as how those services are going to be delivered. And tomorrow's discussion, as we talk about this learning model IEP, that's what that whole document is geared toward, which is to lay out how services will be delivered during a, in a for those who have opted into remote learning. And I keep stuttering over saying that because it's such a difficult thing to, get through to my head that you're opting into remote learning. Um, Lisa, Leona, did you want to add to that? No. <laughs> Sorry. No, I, think, I think you covered it. I think just reaching out to case managers, seeing exactly how things are going to be put into place, and then keeping an open line of communication as often as possible so that when things don't go right, we can quickly change them as much as possible or as quickly as possible and try things differently as the time goes on. I think it's gonna be a learning curve just like in the, in the spring, um, hopefully a little bit less of a learning curve, but I think with open communication, um, you'll probably get the biggest bang for your buck there. And I think that we need to also remember that initially when IEPs were written, they were written for being in school delivery. So in person, in school delivery. So now with a remote option that you are looking at, how those services are going to be delivered is definitely going to be different. And there may be changes in the quantity of the time that are that the services are coming. Uh, you're not getting it in person any longer. So now it's going to be remote. And what is that going to look like? So you want to, again, I know we've said it a couple of times already, but specifically know how and what um, services are going to be provided. And I think one of the big thing, one of the big differences between now and the spring, which will also reflect in how services I think are delivered, is in the spring, they were just giving learning opportunities. The goal now is regardless of the method, um, whatever the school is in person, hybrid or remote, is that we are we're learning like that, you know, we're, we're in school. The expectation is growth and to get through the curriculum. Um, we're not just holding on to figure out what's coming tomorrow, uh, like a holding pattern that we we're in September. And I think that's really important too, because even a lot of the students who um, might be choosing to, you know, the families who have chosen to opt out. Remember, this is something that is available to everybody, general gen ed too, not just special education. So some students who might have chose this thinking it was such an easy option for them personally in the spring. And this this fall could be very different. I know in our district, we are in person. If you've remote, if you've opted for remote learning. Um, we have cameras in the classroom, so you're expected to be there. Now we changed to a, we've changed to a block scheduling. So you're expected to be there for over, you know, just over two hours per class with only having that transition time in between. So that's, what our, that's what our district is doing as well. But we're also a very small district. We have four elementary schools. Um, and those teachers are sending a weekly schedule about when they're going to be doing instruction and kids are to be signed on in those times. So there. So it's definitely um, going to be interesting to see how the remote is happening. I think that having as much information up front is going to be really beneficial. So well, I want to add, I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to <laughs> add from the chat to um, Allison about this question. I think that's who it was uh, about this question. Um, Jen Lucier, who is also a parent uh, consultant, is on the call, and uh, she wanted to add to make sure that both of your kids have assistive technology that they may need. And if you would like to talk about that or something, you, please feel free to give us a call. Our parent consultants, we're all very happy to help, um, especially as we go into these circumstances, these situations. We know that it is very individual based when we get down to what the needs of each student are. 
So thank you, Jen. Go ahead, Liz. Thanks, Sorry Jen. about that. No, 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 that's good. That's good. Thank you for, for sharing that. Um, a point that Leona was making before about in the spring us being in a holding pattern, we didn't really know what was happening. When we first had all of the school, the buildings, the brick and mortars all close their doors and everyone go to this at home distance learning, remote learning, whatever phrase we were using, um, the expectation was it was only going to be for a short period of time. And that maybe we would go back and maybe we would go back and then well no maybe by easter well maybe after spring break and then maybe in may and then it was no no one's going back now we are going into school with a whole different scenario in front of us we are going into school with everything planned for being remote or everything planned to be hybrid so just like leona had mentioned about having uh, cameras in the classrooms that was not always something that was taking place in the spring. So I think that in addition to all of these thoughts that we are having, we also have to remember this is not the spring. We're looking at this from a whole different lens. And so a decision to say, well, I don't want to opt into remote learning because that was just didn't work for my child. You really want to think about why did it not work for your child? What aspect of it did not meet his or her needs? And if you can document all of those things and then kind of weigh that against what else you are looking at in terms of the models that are in, in your particular district, it will be, I think, helpful in, in making a choice if you have not yet already done so. So I'm gonna, um, it's, uh, we have another question clarify still I want to get to your question um, just to re-clarify it but to go back on this Lynn for just a second is in the spring and during the summer we really did take some time with CPAC so our loyal our loyal father followers of which a bunch of you are here we did talk a lot about documentation and documented behaviors and documenting your things at home and now we're going to be pulling that information together and using it to help our children have the best um, re-entry possible, what, no matter what, where it looks like, no matter how we're doing it. So we're gonna be now taking all that information that we've talked about, and I'm sure you have your list, your notepads, because everybody's different on how we keep that uh, information. And you know, this is what we're gonna do with it now. This is the next step. So I'm gonna hop back over to Facebook for just a second to clarify um, Stella's question, because I think I, said it wrong, but just to clarify uh, is if you normally have your child in school with certain services in place, and we are gonna discuss this tomorrow a little bit, but let's just touch upon it quickly. But if you have decided to keep them home due to safety, can you receive services in the home or does a child need to be brought to the school for that? I don't so, think we can really give a, a blanket answer for that. Right. I think that that's really a question for your individual school. Is that option available? Yes. Um, should that option be available? Let's say yes. Is it available is a question for your school. Yeah. And that's pretty much, even though tomorrow we'll get into a little bit more about IEP implementation, um, it's still a very uh, general because each, it is individualized and each district um, does have some leniency to do things a certain way. So. Uh, we'll get into that a little bit more tomorrow. Does anybody have, um, oh, thank you. Um, <laughs> does anybody, sorry, I'm like reading from like 19 different places. Um, does anybody have any other questions? So in the chat, I did put um, the link to the guidance that was on the last slide. Uh, all of this is available on Facebook right now, of course, and it will be available on our YouTube. Uh, it will be uploaded to our YouTube channel. If you don't, if you haven't subscribed to us there, I suggest you do. Uh, you can go back and follow other um, Zoom meetings that we've had. But in the chat, I did add that from uh, Lynn's slide when she was sharing, so you can see that. And what else were we gonna put in here? Um, I, I guess the follow-up and the closing to everything, does anybody have any questions? Adriana, is there anything in the Spanish link? I don't want to lose anybody there. I think as we follow up to everything, 
and to thank you guys for joining today and hopefully joining all week because our thought when saying, you know, CPAC goes back to school is that we would kind of go through it from the beginning terminology of what are we talking about to what it looks like in school and beyond. So we hope that you can follow us all week as we progress through what we consider our school day when they return <laughs> and continue um, to ask questions. And remember that CPAC is here. We do have consultants answering the phones. Uh, we you leave a message, we will get back to you. And then we can answer some individual questions should you have them. Each district, again, if we go back to the image that Lynn had of the map with what is every district was doing, what always sticks out to me is how many districts are undecided at this point. Um, thank you, Lynn. You're welcome. <laughs> if, you take, if you just take a look and then you also take a look, the gray is really undecided and some of them have decided since then, but just to really look at uh, how diverse everything is. And so that's why it's really important to understand what is going on on your district and know that we're here for you. So uh, Lisa, do you have anything to add? No, I think if come on back, we'll talk more about it. If you come up with any questions, we'll be here at three o'clock every day this week. And we'd love to hear from you. Lynn? So, no, just wanted to say thank you very much for participating. And we hope to see you again as we continue through this discussion this week. If anything comes to you overnight or you know later on this afternoon, you can drop a question to us. Um, our email address is cpac at cpacinc.org. And you can send it to us and we'll be sure to address it. What I think we're going to try to do is maybe capture any questions that we get throughout the week. And then that way we can be sure to provide a response publicly to everyone uh, for any questions that come up. I also so want to thank all the people that we have on here. Adriana, do you have anything to? Uh, yes, I'm going to say something in Spanish. Gracias a los que se unieron a la llamada. Yo sé que es la primera vez que intentamos con los eh, subtítulos. Vamos a enviar un email con las instrucciones por separado para que todos tengan acceso y puedan eh, hacer, eh, ver la traducción simultáneamente. Gracias. Gracias por su paciencia. Thank you so much, Adriana, for joining us and participating today. I also want to shout out to everybody else, um, our CPAC co-workers and staff that are on here with providing the support and um, information uh, to help us make sure that all of your questions are answered. So if nobody has any more questions, we just look forward to seeing all of you back tomorrow. I'm sorry, there was one quick Facebook question and that was just if the information would be available again. And I'll just reiterate, it is available on uh, Facebook for, for as soon as we hit end. And um, again, it will be available starting tomorrow on uh, YouTube. So that should be it. But otherwise, Fiona, we hope to see you all tomorrow. Say something? Oh, yes, of course. Go ahead. You want to say something? A mm -hmm. few seconds. Um, say thank you, Adriana and Kiomari, because he is he, he working uh, very, very hard for the group in Spanish. So I'm participating in English and Spanish. It's, it's awesome group, both. So thank you so much for every support in Spanish and English. So uh, my English is not so good, but thank you so much. And suggest. Very suggestive, but my for my language, you know, for the parent, you know. Thank you so That's much Maria. for everything support uh, with the parent and every district. That's it, Maria. It's un gusto. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Thank you, Maria. It's always a pleasure to see you and participate. Um, and everybody else who's here all the time, we really, we just appreciate it. So thank you guys so much. We'll see you at three o'clock tomorrow, hopefully. Thank you all. <laughs>